this week on Forward. So the reality is your individual vote is not going to decide the outcome of any race. It doesn't mean it's not important. It is important, but it's important because it's an expression of who you are and what you value. And we spend so much time voting, trying to minimize our maximum regret. Uh, and so we vote for candidates, or we really more, more precisely, we vote against candidates we hate and we fear instead of voting for candidates we love or who inspire us or who have policies that align with us. And that's why, again, I think we've got such a difficult time. It is my pleasure to welcome to the podcast someone who maybe should have been on here a little while ago, uh, the author of a declaration of independence, one of the godfathers of independent politics. And if you haven't heard his story, you're going to be fascinated by it. Greg Orman. Welcome, Greg. Good morning. Great to be with you, Andrew. You too. So you and I have been uh, friends friendly for a couple of years now. You were someone who, when I went independent, uh, were was sort of like a welcome wagon. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Bust out the well, welcome wagon and we're like, oh, I've, I've, I've kind of um, seen this before. Uh, and you recount your journey in your very, very uh, well-written book, A Declaration of Independence. But how the heck did you become a political independent? Give people a sense of your background, because I think your story is fascinating. Yeah, yeah, happy to. And again, I'm, I'm the welcome wagon because I've always said the problem with independents are they're independent. You know, they don't work together. And so anything that we can do to bring people into the movement and new leadership, I'm I'm always an advocate for that. And I'm glad that you saw the light a couple of years ago and, and are, are now on your own journey. You know, my, mine started, my interest in politics goes way back. You know, my, my maternal grandfather uh, was Hubert Humphrey's top aide for 25 years. Uh, you know, my mom, as a result of that, she was a nurse. She was a union member. Um and, you know, as a result, as you might expect, she was a registered Democrat. Uh, my father, on the other hand, was a small business owner uh, and, you know, sort of uh, didn't really have uh, much use for politicians or, or people who hadn't, you know, had a payroll and had to had to deal with all sorts of uh, regulatory issues, et cetera. And so he was naturally, as a small business owner, a Republican. So I I tell people it might have been a way to survive my household that I that I ended up choosing an independent path because uh, my parents were obviously from each of the parties. In 1980, uh, when I was in the sixth grade, I, I actually uh, managed John Anderson's presidential campaign at our school, Kennedy Elementary in Mankato, Minnesota. Uh, and we, we, we were able to, to get to a draw. Uh, actually, Anderson tied uh, Carter uh, in that election in our school, which shows you you can't put a whole lot of stock in the, the youth vote. Um, and, um, you know, ultimately, I, I got involved in a number of youth and government programs. I went to a, a program called Boys State run by the American Legion, ended up going to Boys Nation, uh, got elected president of Boys Nation, came home and told my father excitedly that I've I wanted to get into politics someday, and he looked at me and he said, "Why don't you skip the internship and go straight into crime?" Um, and you know, but that was my dad. That was his perspective of politics and politicians. But he had a, you know, he had a credible point. Well, right now, point, a lot of Americans would agree with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I think so. But he, but his point, you know, his point was a more interesting one, a little more nuanced than what that suggested. He said, "Look, you may decide to go into politics someday, but you really should accomplish something with your life first. Uh, because you want to be in a position to genuinely contribute, number one. And number two, you can't need the job. Uh, because if you find yourself in a position where you need the job, then you're going to do anything in your power to keep it. Yep. And so if you want to truly represent people, if you want to truly uh, help improve the lives of Americans, you can't be beholden to anybody. And I think that's sort of the root of my being an independent. I've always said I'm an independent for three reasons. One, uh, because I put my country uh, over any political party. Uh, two, because I use facts and common sense to solve problems. I don't cling to rigid ideologies. Um, and three, because I don't want to be obligated to party bosses and special interests. I want to be able to genuinely serve 
uh, the American people. And so that that's what really drew me to to independent politics. And at some in some senses, it goes back to what my father said, which is be in a position uh, to contribute uh, and be in a position where you don't need the job. Uh, and I think far too many politicians today, you know, need the job. You've met a lot of them. I've met a lot of them. You know, frankly, I wouldn't hire them to be a mid-level manager at most of my companies. For many people in Washington today, this is the best job they're ever going to have. Uh, and as a result of that, they're willing to do anything to keep it. And I always say public service without courage uh, quickly becomes self-service. And that's what I think we have in Washington today is a lot of self-servants. Uh, and I've come to conclude that the two-party system is irreparably broken. Uh, and the only way that we're going to get out of our governing rut and get our country back into the business of solving problems for the American people uh, is if we create a real third force in our politics. Yeah. So, Greg, not only are we dressed alike, but we think alike and have had a lot of the same experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so I want to recount for some people your bio um, because I, I thought it was uh, extraordinary. So your parents split up when you're young. Uh, your dad's a small business owner. You, you're growing up in Minnesota, but he runs a furniture store um, across the state border in Kansas. Uh, I, if I get this right, well, you, you don't you don't quite have the geography right. Kansas is actually three state borders away, but yes. Oh, so he did he drive a, a, like uh, that far every day to get to the business? The yeah, the business is in Kansas, so he he basically either drove or flew every week wow. and, and spent a week, you know, he'd spend Saturdays with us and then he would spend Monday through Friday uh, in Kansas City and come back and spend Saturdays with us and spend Monday through Friday in, in Kansas City. So your parents split up. Uh, your mom's a single mom with, was it uh, how many kids? Well, my parents split up. Uh, they had four children. My mom got remarried, had two more and divorced again. So as a 31 year old, uh, she had six kids and was a single mom. And so we, you know, we grew up, uh, got got the benefit of the free and reduced price lunch program, occasionally got, uh, you know, sub subsidized cheese and other things from the Department of Agriculture when they had those those programs available to people. Uh, so, you know, I've, I've, I've lived uh, certainly a, a, a modest life growing up. Yeah. So so you grow up a uh, single mom, you're a talented kid. Um, you get into Princeton uh, you then say, Hey, I'm going to try and, uh, figure out how to start a business as soon as I can. Um, you start your career at McKinsey, but then you quickly leave to start a renewable lighting company that's based closer to your hometown in Kansas. You build that company into something and then it becomes something of like a, a family of companies. You might even have sold the initial business. Um, you become a successful business person and then you, do something highly, highly unusual, which is you decide to run for senator of Kansas as an independent in 2014. And uh, you were described as the most interesting man in politics at that time. For people who love independent candidates, uh, they're like, oh, my gosh, like, uh, you know, like, how does this person come out and get 42.5 percent of the vote statewide in Kansas? I mean, that's that's like a very, very uh, close race in the scheme of things. It was close enough where the Republican royalty descended on Kansas with the big guns. I mean, uh, you know, everyone came out because they were afraid the guy was going to lose to you, the independent. Uh, so yeah. how the heck do you go from a business person to I'm going to put a label on you for a second, but, you know, bear with me for a second. You're like the Ross Perot of Kansas. <laughs> Well, I, My, yeah, minus the Democratic candidate with some like other wrinkles. But you were, you know, I mean, like you were the biggest independent threat to the duopoly, uh, maybe before a sense of the Senate level. I mean, like the, the closest thing since has been Evan McMullen last year in Utah, which had some parallels because the Democrats didn't run a candidate. And then there, there was a Republican, uh, Mike Lee, that people didn't like so much. And then Evan uh, and I think Evan wound up around the same level as as what you got in 2014 but that's like an incredible showing uh so what was the decision to run and tell us about that race well it sort of goes back because i after um uh, 2008 i considered running for the u.s senate and i considered running as a democrat actually in large part because 
Pat Roberts, the incumbent at the time, was a Republican, and there was no pathway to beating him in the Republican Party. And while I considered running as an independent in 2008, everybody I talked to said to me, you can't win as an independent. You, you, you just, you, it's, a, it's a wasted effort. Why would you do it? You should run as a Democrat. And that just didn't feel right to me. So I, I formed an exploratory committee. And after about three months of sort of dealing with what I thought were party politics, it just I just realized I wasn't a Democrat. I couldn't run as a Democrat. The requirements uh, for the positions you had to take on policy to, to be able to be successful as a Democrat just didn't fit well for me. I described it to people like an organ donor recipient uh, rejecting the organ. And so I dropped out, uh, elected not to run. And then uh, started an organization called the Common Sense Coalition because I still wanted to create a place where the sensible center had a home and where we could have an impact on politics. And we grew that over three or four years, got to the point where we had a quarter of a million followers on Facebook. In fact, when the government shut down on October 1st, uh, 2014 uh, or 2013, we actually... Uh, had the most uh, liked Facebook post at that time when we put up a picture of Congress and, and the caption underneath it was, may I suggest the first 535 layoffs? Um, it, and Again, it really, res- agree with you. <laughs> yeah, it re- really resonated with people at the time. But I realized something going through that process because I was my, the principal issue that motivated me was sort of fiscal stability. I wanted to make sure that we weren't saddling future generations with debts and obligations uh, for them to pay uh, based on dollars that we were spending. Um, And what I realized was when I thought about it, there were a number of organizations doing that. There was the Concord Coalition, the Peterson Foundation, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget. Dave Walker had his Comeback America effort. And despite the well-intentioned efforts of a whole bunch of people, uh, that issue over three decades hadn't improved. Oh yeah, I mean, we we all know now it's uh, it, it's gotten much much worse uh, to the point where even some friends of mine who are not normally concerned about this sort of thing are starting to get concerned. Yeah, well, I mean, just just look at what's happening to Bitcoin, which is in part a reflection of the fact that people don't uh, uh, fundamentally believe in the underlying government currencies out there because of all the debt that they're they're taking on. But the other the, the other so the, the first observation was if we don't affect electoral outcomes, we can be well-intentioned, focused on policy, we can do creative videos and interesting stuff. It's not going to motivate politicians because again, they're not trying to solve the problem of how do I improve the lives of the American people. They're trying to solve the problem of how do I get reelected. Hey YouTube, thanks for watching. Please do hit like and subscribe and hit that bell if you want to be notified every time a new episode drops. Probably on Mondays, but hit that bell and thank you. So there's a structural incentives problem that you figure out between 08 and 14. And I think there was even an effort for you to say, wait a minute, um, we should get a bunch of people to run for Senate as independents to form this fulcrum in uh, in D.C. And so there were seven states that you were trying to recruit people from. And then the, the problem yeah. was that a lot of people looked at it and, and thought it was a fool's errand. And then it, and then you, you ended up in the situation that a lot of us end up in, which is you're like, yeah, screw it. Like, I'm trying to get people to do this thing. And if I believe, then I guess I'm going to do this thing because it's a little bit lame no offense to anyone because I've, I've done it too it's a little bit lame to try and get someone else to do something that you're not willing to do yourself <laughs> that's, that, that's exactly right and in fact you described that perfectly we did polling in 17 states we found seven of them where it, where it was clear that there was a pathway for an independent the right independent and we couldn't get anybody to run and you know there were all sorts of reasons why people didn't want to run But at the end of the day, I sort of said what you just said. If I believe in this strongly enough, it's time to suit up and do it. And so we did what everybody does. We did a pre-election poll, uh, and that had us getting 7% of the vote. Uh, We then did an informed ballot where you attack the Republican, you attack the Democrat, you attack yourself, and you do positives on everybody. And we were able to get up to about 15%. 
But one of the things that I realize about independent politics, and I, I think it's, it's what I've described in my book as a gravitational pull, is that because there's this belief out there that independents can't win, so many voters don't consider independent candidacies and they don't take them seriously. But if you can break through that gravitational pull, you can get enough public support that people start to say, hey, wait a minute, maybe this person can win. Um, then that group of people, which is about 60 percent of Americans, starts to reconsider their choices. And it sort of has this trampoline effect. Let's dig into this for a second, because I think it's really important. Um, I agree with you. Uh, that there's like an escape velocity you have to try and hit if you're an independent yep. for anyone to think you have a chance. And so the two cheat codes uh, are fame and money. Like right now, sure. if, uh, if if a certain human rolled out of bed, um, let's call him uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger or or one of like the, the people that actually won one of these types of contests was Jesse Ventura, who became governor of Minnesota as an independent. Um, and so if, if you have fame and or money, preferably both, and then people say, oh, like maybe this person can win because they can kind of short circuit <laughs> the, the, yeah. the resistance and bounce on the trampoline, to your point. Yeah, well, and interestingly, Jesse's an interesting story. Um, I, I agree with you. If Dwayne The Rock Johnson rolled out of bed and said, I want to be president, uh, a lot of folks would take him seriously. Uh, in Jesse's case, Jesse was still polling in the single digits in late September you know, early October. What did it for Jesse was getting in the gubernatorial debates. And the reason he was in the debates was because Skip Humphrey, the Democrat, uh, did a poll. And that poll showed that for every vote Jesse took from Skip, he took 2.4 votes from Norm Coleman, the Republican. So Skip demanded that Jesse be in the debates. And when Jesse got in the debates, he was so sensible and he was so distinct. You know, they asked him questions like, what are you going to do about the Iron Range Recovery Board? And he said, you know, I got to be honest with you. I don't know what the Iron Range Recovery Board is, but let me tell you about how I'm going to spend money. Uh, and then, you know, they asked him, the, you know, the, the, they were talking about education and Skip Humphrey was attacking Norm Coleman about his private risky voucher scheme for public education. He said, I support public education in Minnesota. And Jesse looked at him and said, Skip, I'm confused. Did you go to a public school in Minnesota? Did your children go to a public? Has a Humphrey gone to a public school in Minnesota in 100 years? And the answer was no. And so he just came off as so sensible and gave the American people, and in this case, the people of Minnesota, what they really wanted, which was an authentic candidate. So I don't know that Jesse's fame actually, Jesse's fame got him to like 7%. Uh, it was being in those debates, which is something that I think if we look at the crop of potential independent candidates for the presidential contest this cycle, if Robert F. Kennedy Jr. gets into those presidential debates, if they have them, uh, you know, it'll be really interesting to see how the American people at this point in time react to someone who might potentially get up there and just appear to be sensible relative to to relatively disliked candidates. Um, so in, in any event, in, in my case, you know, we ended up running. We decided to run because I believe that that gravitational pull was full. True. I, I look at polls as balance sheets, not cash flow or income statements. And so I believe they're just a, a moment in time. And you can change that moment in time based on how you get out there and interact with voters. And so in June of 2014, basically five months before the election, uh, we launched a campaign uh, to run to run for the United States Senate in 2014. The Democrat came out and said, Greg's just a closeted conservative. The campaign manager for the Republican said he's a liberal masquerading as an independent. You know, they did what they do, which is try to push you back into that blue red frame. But I just went out and talked to voters. I, and I remember distinctly going out to where Pat Roberts lived, Dodge City, Kansas, and I didn't see a single Pat Roberts sign up. And I talked to voters there and very few people really supported him. And I ultimately Dude, it's, ended. It's true, it's true half the time. It's like half the time people don't even like the person who's, uh, you know, the elected official. And they, they, they just are in there and like half people don't know who they are. I mean, in Pat Roberts' case, they probably did know who he was, but he wasn't very well liked. 
Yeah, well, and Bob Dole even said that when he traveled the state because he did a statewide tour that year. He said he was surprised the enthusiasm for Pat was so low. But I ended the night in Dodge City at a place called Youthville. And uh, Youthville is a, 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 a residential housing program for kids in the foster care system who are troubled. And the night, it was probably 930 at night, the sun was setting. And I, I, I thank the director for spending the time with me and for, for staying so late. And he looked at me and he said, Greg, in 30 years, Pat Roberts hasn't come and seen us once. He said, I would have stayed till midnight to show you what we're doing here because I think it's so important. As I, I got on a train, I took an overnight train back to Kansas City. And as I was getting on that train and sort of nestling into my seat, I realized uh, there's a chance to beat this guy. Uh, and so we went out, we, we did a bus tour. We called it our problem solving, not partisanship bus tour. Everywhere we went, we tried to work in, in the community and solve an actual problem that they were having. We, dig, we dug ditches. We, we worked in soup kitchens. We worked in women's shelters. Uh, and we went out, we, we met the people of Kansas we learned what they cared about, and we talked about it. And we went from 7% in the polls in June. We were at about 14% in July. In August, around the time of the Republican Party, or the Republican primary, we were at about 20%. And then in late August, we moved into second place. And we were at 25%, the Democrat was at 23 and the incumbent Republican was only at 32 uh, there were a lot of people who were still debating what to do. And then the world changed because the Democrat decided to drop out. And, you know, in, in hindsight, uh, that that ended up being a problem for us because it allowed them to finally sell the narrative they'd been trying to sell, which was that Greg's a Democrat. You know, before it was hard for them to do that when there actually was a Democrat the in the Democrats race. There, yeah. and, and, you know, we ultimately ended up losing by a slightly greater margin than we were behind in, on Labor Day when the Democrat dropped out. You know, ultimately, I think, you know, we would have had a different race had that not happened because we would have done what Republicans and Democrats do to independents all, all along, which is they, they say, well, they can't win. So a vote for the Democrat is really a vote for Pat Roberts. Sure. I, I think we would have flipped the script and, and I think we would have had a, uh, potentially a better outcome. This podcast is sponsored by ExpressVPN. Going online without ExpressVPN is like changing while leaving your window wide open. You might not have anything to hide, but why give randos a chance to invade your privacy? When you go online without a VPN, ISPs can see every single website you visit and they can legally sell this information without your consent to ad companies and big tech who can then use your data to target you and profit, not to your benefit, generally at your expense. So using ExpressVPN, it's like being a member of a high tech company that's on your side where they beam you into a server in another part of the world. No one can see anything you do. Just fire up the app, click one button and you're beamed onto a completely safe, anonymized internet. They can't do anything with your data. I use ExpressVPN to have that peace of mind. To secure your online activity by visiting expressvpn.com slash yang today. That's E-X-P-R-E-S-S VPN.com slash yang. And you can get an extra three months for free. Expressvpn.com slash yang. It was also interesting that at that time my my positive approval rating was plus twenty-four. Which you, yeah. you know from politics is is remarkable. Enormous. We had we had forty seven percent positive approval rating, twenty three percent negative. On election day, it was plus one. Uh, the Republicans came in and basically, as you said, not only brought the Republican royalty every major Republican campaign in Kansas, but they also spent seventeen million dollars over the last wow. month of the campaign. In that state, that's an enormous amount. It, it is. It you know. To, a quarter of a million dollars buys a thousand rating points in Kansas. So it was an enormous amount of money. When I did a debate in Wichita, the general manager of the, the news station came, to, came up to me and thanked me for his kid's college education. 
because they were able to raise ad rates so much that his bonus was high enough to pay for his kid's college. Um, you know, that's that's what happened in that race. The Washington Post referred to it as an unprecedented re Republican rescue effort. Um, and it really was. But it was a great, great experience, great opportunity to really meet with people in Kansas, see the issues they really care about. Um, and, you know, just fascinated uh, in talking to the people of Kansas about the things they care about. Um, and, you know, I, th I thought it was a privilege. Was the recruitment effort uh, successful in any of the other states? Uh, did anyone try this? Because I think I met I think no. one person, Neil Simon, who at least thought about it, Like, but it was just you? Well, in 2014, it was just me. Neil ran in 2018, and we recruited Neil to run in 2018 in Maryland. And Neil sort of uh, experienced in 2018 something that I experienced in 2018, which is you sort he, he sort of didn't reach that escape velocity. I think he might have had one poll that had him in the mid to high teens. Uh, and then in the next poll, he, he sort of fell back down to earth. So, you know, he, he was close. I would say Neil was close to, to reaching escape velocity, to breaking through that gravitational pull, but didn't quite do it. And 2018 was a unique year because some of the people who would logically support independence really got invested in putting a check on Trump. Uh, and so even you, you look at someone like Michael Bloomberg, who was a big supporter of mine in 2014, uh, by the way, along with a bunch of Republicans who were big supporters of mine in 2014. But Bloomberg gave exclusively to House Democrats. You know, his goal was to get the House back in Democratic hands so that there was a legitimate uh, check, check on, Trump, Don, yeah. on Donald Trump. And so we just we just lost a lot of what I would consider to be natural supporters who got much more invested in that battle against Trump. In fact, one of my other supporters was a was a, a good friend of mine who at the time lived in North Carolina. And he sent me an email and said, you know, Greg, I'd love to support you. But for so many reasons, I have to put my resources into the Democrats this cycle. And, you know, this was someone who had given money to a super PAC that supported me in 2014 and, you know, ultimately ended up uh, making a decision to uh, consolidate his resources in support of Democrats. So you're walking around with a, with like still a lot of energy in Kansas and you say, ooh, like, you know, like I, I should take another shot at this because we came so close. Um, you end up pivoting to the governor's race. Uh, I believe it was four years later. Was that 2018? That's correct. So you came closer to upending uh, the duopoly than really, you know, most anyone has in the nation's history. If you look around uh, there, you know, if, if you look about at major independence, uh, you know, there was Ross Perot in 92, um, uh, Jesse Ventura, you. Um, but it, it's a v relatively short list of people who've uh, genuinely contested um, a statewide race uh, in, in this way. And so you write this book. It's a little bit of a manifesto. And by the way, I'm, I'm going to explore the parallels in a minute. Uh, so a declaration of independence. So and it's written after your Senate race. You go through the very, very um, well reasoned and researched case as to why the two party system is screwing us, which, uh, as you know, I, I agree with. Uh, and then you throw your hat back in the ring um, for this governor's race that ends up taking on like a different cast, in part because that time uh, the Democrat sticks around. And then something happens, I think. That, uh, so correct me if I'm wrong. Kansas is a red state in my mind, at least. You are the third candidate in this gubernatorial race and the Democrat wins. Did I get that all that right? Yeah, you, you did. And, you know, Kansas has a history of electing Democratic governors. So, uh, you know, they had not elected when I ran for the U.S. Senate, they had not elected a, a non-Republican to the U.S. Senate in 80 years. If you go back over the last 30 years, there's roughly an equal number of years where Republicans are governor and an equal number of years where Democrats were. 2018 was a, was a case where we, you know, again, we got to the point where we just didn't break through that gravitational pull. And the, in the polling that we did in August... Uh, we were at 19 percent. Laura Kelly, the Democrat who ultimately won, was at 32. And Chris Kobach, uh, who was considered a, a very Trumpian like candidate in the Kansas gubernatorial race, was at 38 percent. And so we knew pretty well in late August that the anti Kobach vote was going to consolidate uh, behind uh, Laura Kelly. And it's, you know, it's interesting. Uh, Hay uh, Fort Hayes State 
uh, does a poll. It's a sort of a Voices of Kansas poll in October of every election year. And it was interesting in that poll, I had higher name ID than the Democrat. Many people who said they liked me and, you know, were lukewarm on the Democrat when asked who they were going to vote for said they were going to vote for the Democrat. Uh, and I, I heard that in a lot of places that I went. In fact, I was at a meeting, a YPO meeting in Wichita. And one guy said to me, you know, look, Greg, if I could pick the governor, it would be you. But I'm so concerned that Kobach's going to get elected that I think I have to vote for Laura Kelly. And another guy sitting at the same table said, you know, Greg, if I could pick the governor, it would be you. But I'm so concerned that Laura Kelly is going to get elected. I, I really feel like I have to vote for Chris Kobach. And what I said to both of them was, well, you know, why don't you just both agree to vote for me and you'll cancel out the other concern. But that was something that was on the minds of so many people was they were really pr primarily concerned about Chris Kobach getting elected. Uh, he was, you know, part of uh, Donald Trump's well, now, sort of immigration we, team. Seen, yeah, we've all seen the movie before, man. It's like, oh, snap, I really have to make sure that this person I'm very, very scared of or hate does not win. And so uh, I will vote with uh, the blue team or the red team um, because that's the way most voters are trained. And they're also trained to your point that an independent candidate can't win and that you're wasting your vote by giving it uh, to, to. Yeah. Well, vote. let's, ex let's explore that one a little bit um, because, you know, I've, I've heard that wasted vote argument from the press often. And I, you know, I, what I like to say to people is, you know, how many people in this country have been struck by lightning more than once? The answer is over a dozen. And how many people have won multi-million dollar lottery prizes more than once? The answer is, you know, about a dozen. How many people have had their vote decide the outcome of a statewide election? Zero. In the United States, it's zero. In the history of America, there's only been one statewide race. It was about 180 years ago, decided by a single vote. So the reality is your individual vote is not going to decide the outcome of any race. It doesn't mean it's not important. It is important, but it's important because it's an expression of who you are and what you value. And we spend so much time voting trying to minimize our maximum regret. Uh, and so we vote for candidates, or we really more, more precisely, we vote against candidates we hate and we fear Instead of voting for candidates we love or who inspire us or who have policies that align with us. And if you think about the implications of that, what that means is to get elected, I don't need to improve your life. I don't need to do things to improve our country. I don't need to even need to enact the promises I make when I'm running as a candidate. All I need to do is make you afraid of my opponent. And that's a bridge to nowhere. Um, and that's why, again, I think we've got such a difficult time. Hey, all, if you know me, you know I'm not that handy in the kitchen, and I have become a huge believer and booster of Factor. Factor's delicious, ready-to-eat meals make eating a joy. It's so fast, you just pop that thing two minutes later, and you are eating a restaurant-quality healthy meal making you feel excellent about yourself. My favorite is the turkey chili with zucchini and there is so much more to choose from. You never get tired of it. It fits any budget. It's fast, healthy. It is going to be the new factor in your life. Yes, I'm a fan. Head to factormeals.com slash yang50 and use code yang50 to get 50% off your first box and two free wellness shots per box while subscription is active. That's code YANG50 at factormeals.com slash YANG50 to get 50% off your first box. Get Factor today. It's going to change the way you eat. It, it is a straw man because the, the fact is 90% uh, of votes are wasted right now because you're... you're um, voting in something that's a, for, or a foregone conclusion uh, in terms of the pro like the general elections of 90% of our members of Congress. I mean, it's a, well, it's a clearly you, blue zone or red zone. And so they've already gamed it out. And then they go vote, vote, vote. But the truth is, uh, you know, they already know who's going to win the general because that they've uh, gerrymandered the crap out of, you know, 90% of the races. 
Yeah. <laughs> like, I mean, the, but, so, and, so right and now it's like, it's like theater. Like we're all being sold. It's like, oh, vote, vote, vote. But if there's anything both parties can agree on, it's to avoid competition whenever possible. So they're like, you take that zone, I take this zone, and then we'll pretend to fight about, you know, like uh, uh, this or that. It's the WWE. I, 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 I believe that entirely. I've written an article about that. Um, you know, two comments on that. First, we never hear the media saying to Biden voters in Alabama, you're wasting your vote. But the, the reality is a Biden voter in Alabama is not going to get Biden elected. By the same token, we don't hear them say it to, to Trump voters in California. But we know in a two horse race that Donald Trump is not going to win California. And so the media sort of applies a double standard. They're more than happy to tell voters they're wasting their votes when voting for independent or third party candidates. But they don't apply the same uh, rigor uh, when talking to members of the duopoly about their voting. But that was what our race was about in 2014. And I said this in my concession speech, you know, at the end of the day, my goal was to make sure partisans everywhere knew that they couldn't go to Washington and just hide behind their party label. They yep. actually had to solve problems for the American people. And, and that's what that race was about. That's what we were trying to accomplish. I remember talking to a Republican voter and he said to me, Greg, everything that you've said makes sense to me. But we need a Republican Senate. <laughs> I know. I know. And, like, and, and by the way, I'm by the mob, way, but like I yeah. just got to do the tribe thing. So, so, but I, but I had the conversation with him. So I said to him, and by the way, in the in the last poll we did before the election, almost two thirds of Pat Roberts voters said we think Greg's a better candidate, but we need a Republican Senate. That was the message that got sold quite effectively in Kansas. And so I said to him, "Well, can I ask you why?" And he said, well, because we're going to rein in an entitlement. And I said, well, how are you going to do that? George Bush tried to do that in 2005 with a Republican House and a Republican Senate didn't get to first base. And he said, well, we're going to prevent Obama from appointing judges. And I said, you know, I understand that. But when when Harry Reid changed the filibuster rule for the appeals court, Mitch McConnell went to the floor of the Senate and said, why are we doing this? We've approved 99% of your judges. So your sole reason for wanting a Republican Senate is to prevent 1% of the Obama appointed judges from holding gavels on the federal bench. At the same time, the things we spend so much money on, Social Security, Medicare, uh, our interest on the debt are not subject to annual appropriations. You know, 70% of the budget grows in an environment of gridlock it doesn't get smaller. And I think what you really want is smarter, more efficient government. And you're not going to get that with gridlock. If you want smarter, more efficient government, you have to send a message to both parties that they need to work together. And the only way to send that message in this race is to vote for me. And he said to me, well, gosh, can you put that on a TV ad? And I said, well, you know, the two, two and a half minute TV ad doesn't really work. Yeah. But but ultimately, the, you know, the whole underpinning, we needed a Republican Senate, really just reinforces this notion that they don't need to get anything done. They just need to be from the right party and they need to make you afraid of the other party. And I, I tell people, I don't think we have strong partisans anymore. I think we principally have strong anti-partisans. They don't love their own party. They just hate and fear the other party so much that they support their party. And that's just, again, that's a bridge to nowhere. This podcast is sponsored by Helix Sleep. I have always been a mattress guy. I thought if you're going to spend eight hours doing something, you should pay attention to what you're doing it on. That's why I love the Helix Sleep product. It is made for me. I am someone who sleeps on my back. I do not sleep hot. I like a firm mattress. And so when I took the Helix Sleep Quiz, I wound up with a Helix Dawn model. And it's been fantastic, not just for me, but for my kids who seek it out out of the entire house. Don't want to take my word for it? Helix has been awarded the number one mattress pick by GQ and Wired Magazine, and they have a 100 night free trial and 10 to 15 year warranty is baked in. That's confidence in your product. And if you get on a Helix Sleep mattress, you will see why they are so confident. Helix is offering 20% off all mattress orders and two free pillows for our listeners. Go to helixsleep.com slash yang and use code helixpartner20. This is their best offer yet and it won't last long. 
With Helix, better sleep starts now. One reason I like and admire you so much, Greg, is I've got a pet peeve about some other people that um, you have defied. So check it out. Uh, Ross Perot runs for president, gets 19% in 92, and then kind of sticks around in 96 um, with the Reform Party, but then um, eventually turns uh, away from it. And the Reform Party um, eventually dissolves. Uh, Mike Bloomberg considers running for president as an independent at least once or twice, um, but then runs for president in 2020. It doesn't go his way. And then he doesn't necessarily stick around to invest in um, making it so that more people like him could run successfully. And that it's, and that it's not, um, you know, like a problem that persists. Uh, Howard Schultz explores an independent run uh, and then leaves the scene. And you have stuck around um, because the problems are still there. Uh, Your diagnosis, I agree with. I came to the same conclusion in uh, 2020, 2021, um, independently, haha. Some of the other folks, it was more, frankly, about like a particular campaign um, and maybe their own um, boxes to check um, than it was trying to dislodge the, the gridlock uh, and the system. Um, and so you and I have been, uh, in my mind, kind of fellow travelers because I ran for president, came out and said, wait a minute, like this system is going to uh, lead us to polarization and ruin and uh, animus and eventual conflict and the rest of it. Um, and now I'm grinding away, uh, trying to create a better dynamic uh, via, via forward. So the, uh, I suppose that the question I'd have for you is that um, there is something that happens and um, I'll just share. There's a little bit intimate, but but whatnot. Um, So I ran for president, didn't win obviously, but came away and had like a lot of energy around me um, and then uh, ran for mayor, didn't win. um, And for these campaigns, you really go through a lot. Uh, And if someone asks you about it, you say something like, oh, it was great. Uh, because I met all these people and I grew so so much and there were all of these uh, tremendous experiences, but there is some part of you that's like, wow, like I, you know, I went through a little bit of a ringer slash, uh, you know, uh, meat grinder, <laughs> like came out the other side. And in your case, you got pelted with $17 million of negative advertising in your home state. I mean, it's madness that there's like a, a, a journey that you go on and you're one of the best of any of these figures, um, my, myself included, because you are like chiseling away in various ways. You're like a smart, competent guy and you're, you're trying to, to make the things happen. And in your book, you say to, to folks who are looking at running as independents, um, you say, yeah, do it. And then you say like, look, all this, this crap about like, can't win. It's like, no, no, it's nonsense. Like, you know, I, I could have sure. won. You know, look, I, I, I look at it. The key to life is the art of falling forward, right? We're, we're all going to make mistakes. We're all going to stub our toes. We're all going to fail at accomplishing something we want to fail. We want to accomplish. And so, you know, you've just got to fall forward. And, and, you know, look, I, I believe that the, sacred idea at the heart of the American social contract is that we leave a better country for future generations. Amen. Uh, And I don't want to be the only generation in American history to fail at that goal. Uh, I've got three kids who I love dearly, who I have the greatest of aspirations for. And while they're going to have to go out and make their own way in this world, I want to leave them an environment that allows them to do that. And and so, you know, in my my mind, we don't have a choice. Look, and I've I've said this to a lot of folks, if if you've got a better way to solve the problem and you can solve the problem, I don't have to be a part of it. I'd rather play golf, to be perfectly honest. But until the problems that concern me are solved, I think I have a, a moral obligation and an obligation to future generations to go out there and do my best at trying to solve it, even in the face of what might seem to be pretty daunting odds. You you know, sometimes I tell people, look, the best things we do are sometimes the hardest things we do. Um, And just because you might fail or you might make a mistake doesn't mean you don't do it. I guess that's one way I'm different from the two leading presidential contenders. You know, according to them, neither of them have ever made a mistake. 
Um, but, you know, in my case, I've made plenty of them. And I recognize the only way you, you deal with that is by getting up, dusting yourself off. You know, Ty Cobb used to say, you know, uh, a guy who's three out of 10 is considered a fail or a success in our game. You know, so you're, you're a major league baseball player. Most of the time that you step up to the plate, you are going to fail. Uh, but you know what? You still step back up to the plate. You take your cuts. You fail. You fail again. You learn. You grow. You get better. You understand. You fail again. But you never stop stepping up to the plate. And and that's sort of my my perspective on all this. Well, that's why you're still doing uh, the awesome and hard work uh, that you are. Uh, you know, it, it's um, awesome to really be in this particular trench alongside you. If people want to follow you and your work, because you are always, frankly, building in this direction, uh, how can they best keep up with you? Well, you know, it's interesting. I've, I've sort of receded from from sort of public stuff. I do have a couple of little efforts I'm working on. One is called We Deserve Better uh, .us, uh, which is really advocating for a, a six pack of reforms that will help us um, sort of fix our broken and corrupt system, which I think is sort of a prerequisite uh, to then solving the problems that really affect the American people. Social uh, reforms, man. Amen. And, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on Twitter, but not very active on it. I write for Real Clear Politics periodically. And, and um, you know, so I'm again, I'm, I'm spending more of my time trying to support other people and other efforts right now, as opposed to being too public myself. Um, but I, I do, I do again, write for real clear politics periodically. And, and, um, I have a, a website, greg ormancom If you're, if, if someone really wants to get in touch, we can put them on a mailing list if they, if they, uh, sign up on that, that website. But again, I'm spending more of my time supporting other organizations that are really going out there and trying to make the, the changes that we all believe we need to make. Well, we do deserve better, my friend. Greg Orman, a Declaration of Independence, one of the patron saints of all independence. Thank you for your work and your friendship and look forward to flipping this table over alongside you in the, frankly, years to come. <laughs> well, hey, it's, it's great to be with you and thank you for everything that you do. You've You've brought a level of, of credibility and, and experience to this movement that, that I think is terrific. And so uh, very, very happy to be in the trench with you as well, Andrew. 